So it seems as though our next phase of the podcast were going the long way around, and as a first time for the podcast, we are revisiting an original William Hartnell story from 1964. It's Doctor Who, the Aztecs. <laughs> Hello, Liam. Hello, Rob. Back again for the next phase. Yep. Yeah. Um, feels a long, feels a long time coming, but yeah, we're we're finally ditching Jodie Whittaker for the time being. Um, and we thought what we would do is go through um, the Doctors and review our respective favourite stories. Uh, and it's, it, I think it's quite good because, as you said during the introduction, we're, we're actually this is the first time it's only taken. 51 podcasts we're finally we're we're looking at a william uh, an original william hartnell not some duffer replacing him as you know yes we've done it we've done richard herndall yeah we've we've done bradley walsh Mm -hmm. no we haven't we've done david bradley yes (laughs) we have done bradley walsh yeah yeah we have yeah so today we're looking at the aztecs um this was my first experience of the first doctor right okay and it's a very early story. It's from the first season. Um, I believe it's the sixth serial. Um, it was broadcast the 23rd of May in 1964, mm-hmm. um, the year after the show's inception. Um, it was written by John Lucarati, who had wrote Marco Polo. Yep, that's right, yeah. Music by Richard Rodney Bennett. And directed by John Crockett, who had also directed an episode of Marco Polo, episode four. Ah, oh, I did not know that. Right, okay, that's interesting. And it's a four-part serial, uh, the first episode being The Temple of Evil. Um, so before we begin that, what's your memory of the Aztecs? Well, it, um, it was quite... I think this may be my second William Hartnell because my first was The Chase, um, uh, and so I think this may be my uh, second Hartnell. And all those years ago, I remember just really, really enjoying it. And as time's gone on, um, every time I revisit it, um, I think it I've always enjoyed it a lot more than you know. I've always enjoyed the story, but I think I appreciate it more as I uh, as I get older. And I think as we review it, it's quite a um, quite a serious well-written drama um and it, obviously this is back in the days of the show going alternating between a pure historical then doing a sort of futuristic science fiction story then doing a, a historical um which we miss i yeah i always have very fond memories of it just being a good story and very good um just very good acting um and in fact when we attended our very first doctor who um, convention because William Russell was there um, I got him to sign a copy of the Aztecs oh that's good I don't remember what I got signed but yeah that was pretty good meeting William Russell yeah yeah that was great in yeah. fact because we sort of interrupt but uh, just remember because we had we had William Russell we had um, oh typical my mind's actually gone blank who were the other two because we had um, oh yeah sorry yeah, because we had William Russell, we had uh, Peter Purvis, and I've forgotten her. Annika Wills. Jeez. Yes. I could forget that, yeah. So it was great. So when we had the interview panel, you had, you know, the three companions, which sort of, you had William Russell, who was at the very beginning of the Hartnell era. You had Peter Purvis, who was sort of at the middle, and then you had Annika Wills, who was at the very end. And hearing, hearing them talk about their time on the show was really interesting in general, but it was sort of really interesting because they each talked about their relationship with William Hart. Um, and he seemed to get a sense of how, because as we know, he was unfortunately uh, sort of forced out of the show because of his ill health. Um, and because of his ill health, he, you know, his temperament could fluctuate quite wildly. And you sort of saw that with, 
you know, with the way that, you know, William Russell talks about him, you know, Russell, William Russell had always respected him as an actor, was absolutely thrilled to be working with him and got on very well with him and found him quite, you know, um, quite pleasant to work with. And then Peter Purvis, who was sort of in the middle, said, you know, it was sort of like a, you had that, but then some of the anger would start to come out. And then you had Annika Wills, who... I think she was quite diplomatic in her response, but seemed to have a sense, you know, she, she found him a little bit unpleasant to work with. It's hard to compare the original team with um, with some of the later groups of companions. Mm-hmm. And then um, the dynamics behind the scenes must have been quite different. I think so, but wa- watching the, the Hartnell era is just, you know, he, you know, he is... He, the man himself, as an actor, he is consistent in his performance. And, you know, despite the ill health he experienced, you know, much, you know, much later on towards the end of his tenure, you're not really aware of that as a viewer, I don't think. No. Um, yeah, he, could, he, you know, gives a cracking good performance. So the cast for this story, of course, Doctor Who was played by William Hartnell, Ian Chesterton, William Russell, Barbara Wright, Jacqueline Hill, Susan Foreman, Caroline Ford, Ort Locke, Keith Poit, Le Taxel, John Ringan, Ixter, Ian Cullen, Kameka, Margot Vanderbilt. So, The Temple of Evil, Part 1 of the Aztecs. We've jumped into this straight after watching the 13th Doctor stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and you might argue that the TARDIS feels a bit overcrowded in 2020, but in contrast with 1963 or 64 in this case, um, when it had the exact same crew complement um, than it does today, it didn't feel overcrowded at all. I think um, each character had something of their own to bring to each story. Each actor um, delivered a very engaged and convincing performance. Um, so I don't think there was even a hint that it was overcrowded at the time. Did you feel that? No, no, not at all. Um, I think the it sort of it complements the approach that the show was taking at the time, and the the characters are one very well uh, written and very well performed, and they each form a um, they each you know perform a function in the series and in the individual stories. So obviously you have got the Doctor who's driving the. Um, the series forward um you know and providing a bit of mystery with uh with that character and that mystery makes him engaging but he's really the one who sort of provides the main um purpose of the series you have susan the, his granddaughter um who is sort of there for the the younger viewers uh to lash on to um and then you have Ian Chesterton, who is a science teacher, so he can bring scientific understanding, but also he's the much younger man to the Doctor. So, when the story requires some sort of action, he can he can get involved in and um, have fights and so on, and be the defender of the the TARDIS crew, if you like. And then you have Barbara, who's um, you know she's a history teacher, so she can provide the historical um, knowledge for when the show would require that. Um, and I think with the Aztecs, I think it's a, I think this story is a really good example of how this uh, approach and with this TARDIS crew, how that approach can work and work really well. Because I think John Lucarotti, um, he he fashions a very well balanced drama because there's an awful lot going on, um, as we'll you know as we'll talk about it. Jacqueline Hill, who plays Barbara, the main focus is on her, but. You don't feel like any of the other characters have been shortchanged in any way. No. Um, I guess if you had to single one out, perhaps Susan, mm-hmm. who we see less of. Yes, that's true. Uh, yep. When they arrive in the tomb, Susan says to Barbara that um, that the priest in the tomb is a man, and I think she says like, "How can they believe that she's a reincarnation of him if Barbara's a woman?" <laughs> Um, and this is just delving into the Doctor Who lore a little bit, but don't you think this would defy what Susan's view of genders would be? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not but, a fair point to make on this story. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Um, I suppose you could argue that because if you, if you do want to sort of uh, 
going, oh, there's a continuity plot hole here, what with what the show's done since. I suppose you could argue going well, Susan had, um, you know, when we first encounter them in An Earthly Child, which is a very first Doctor Who story, it, isn't it sort of hinted that they've, they've been there for several months? So, you know, obviously she would understand the gender roles of, you know, of the time and society that she's in. Yeah. Um, she's well versed in history as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they leave the tomb and the door subtly closes and the characters are presented with a problem. Um, it's a very simple um, kind of story. They're presented with this problem, they need to get back to the TARDIS and it's the whole workaround of how to get back there and of course there's a solution but there's also problems along the way. Um, so it's a very simple but clever story and as they walk out to the precipice of this Aztec um, temple we have it the backdrop but it does feel um, like it has a big scope this story even though we're limited to a handful of sets here <laughs> I think there's the um, the tomb and the, the temple and there's the garden and also there's um, where Ixta dwells, the warrior's room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think there's many many rooms beyond that, but it does feel like um, it does feel like it has more scope than it probably does. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, yeah, very much so. I think yeah, because I mean, this was um, this is very much a serial made in the very early '60s, and with the you know, it's it's. You know, Doctor Who's well known for this is that it didn't have the budget that it actually deserved, um, and for a, a television show which was conceived, um, you know, to to be at the cutting edge of what television could achieve at that time with special effects and so on, which is what um, Sidney Newman wanted. Um, the fact that it wasn't given the budget in order to do that um, is a shame, and then. For most of the early years of Doctor Who, it was made in Lime Grove, which was quite, a, you know, compared to BBC Television Centre, was a very primitive um, recording studio, and it didn't have the space, and it was quite cramped. So, uh, you know, when you're at the top, you know, w- with a temple set, and you've got this uh, this painted backdrop, which is meant to be of the, the vistas of of um, the Aztec city that they are in. You know, it's obviously it's supposed to be. You know, we can quite clearly see it's um, it is a painted backdrop. But you know what? When I was watching it, um, I'm not bothered about that. I wasn't bothered when I was a kid, and I'm still not bothered now. I'm still sold by the the design of it. I think the design of the story looks fantastic, and I think for the limited budget that they had, they really stretched it, and it looks fantastic. If you're if you're watch if you've got the DVD of the Aztecs and you're looking at the photo gallery. It has, um, for example, it has uh, photographs of the the garden set, um, and it looks. It doesn't look that impressive, but when you're watching the story because of the camera angles, the way that the story was directed, you're not aware of the limitations. It's it look it, the story looks great, um, and to to get to your point as well is that yeah we've only got these these several sets, but you don't feel that the story's limited. Um, it, it does have this scope and feel and you do feel like it is grounded in in an actual as you know in actual aztec society yes and the sets do feel um very stone don't they yeah you can really it's almost like you can feel the the masonry that's went into building it even though it's probably just a wooden set yeah i did find it hard to believe that the son of the temple's architect um or builder it would still be alive. Um, this kind of architecture surely would um, would have took generations to build. I mean, look at the the ancient Egyptians. Um, they had an abundant abundance of slave workers, and it took them quite a while <laughs> to build anything. Yeah, that yeah, that's true. Would, um, <laughs> you know what? That's that, that's never crossed my mind. Every time I've seen this story. Um, I need to stop finding problems with this story. No, no, I mean it's actually I'm laughing at myself for for sake because actually that's that's quite a, a, an obvious thing to pick up on. But I've never, you know, when I've watched the Aztecs, I, it's 
I've never picked up on it. It's <laughs> but actually now that we, you point we, it out, we it's could assume obvious. that the temple was built, but the tomb was completed <laughs> um, by Exeter's father. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Yeah, if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So Barbara and Susan, the kind of muse on the culture, the the beauty and the horror, and um, developing hand in hand. So we. We always have these uh, pictures in our minds of these ancient cultures. Um, they were either quite brutal or quite civilized. Um, and in this instance, we're showing the the two sides of them. Um, and this um, this comes across in the different characters and the parallels between them as well. Mm-hmm. And the doctor informs Barbara of the human sacrifice and insists that she doesn't interfere, but she decides she'd like to intervene. You know, to change history so the good of the Aztecs survives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this very noble idea with the best of intentions. And the doctor replies to this by imploring her not to, saying that it's utterly impossible. And he says, Believe me, I know. With yeah. this moment of reflection on his face, um, which t- tells us that perhaps he's tried himself and failed. Mm, to mm-hmm. change something, yeah, yeah. Um, which seems to have left him kind of defeated and resigned to letting events play out. Is that how you took that moment? He had some kind of something lingering in his mind. Oh yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, one, I, I absolutely love that scene. Um, it underpins, you know, the, the the drama of the story that that's really going to unfold for the remaining three episodes. Because mm-hmm. as you said before. Uh, it's this, you know, we're, we're given this simple idea, which is um, the TARDIS crew become separated from the TARDIS and they need to get back to it. It's really simple. But the story becomes much more than that. And it's it's this scene which, uh, you know, it, it, the story starts to cement and it's like, right, Barbara's in this position to, um, as she sees it, to completely change history for the better. And she's in a position, obviously, because I think we recognise that human sacrifice is an awful thing. So she's, you know, she's coming from an ethical, moral, moral perspective as far as she's as far as she's concerned. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, she so it's it's a really good scene. It's very well written, and um, the actors involved play it really well. But yeah, it's it's that line which which sticks. You know, you know, you can't rewrite history not one line, and then just go and in the one last appeal. Um, what you're trying to do is utterly impossible. I know, believe me, I know. And yeah, it is. It is sort of very interesting. It is this. Um, I think it's telling. There is the sense of the Doctor understands where Barbara's coming from, but knows it, she can only fail um, because he's tried something like that himself. Um, so yeah, Either in his in his travels, or uh, it would be nice if it had been foreshadowing something like a reveal to his past. Well, yeah, that's true. But I mean, I think at this point in the show's history, you know, everything that we knew about the Doctor was mysterious. It's um, we're not supposed to know everything. But every now and again, there would be these little glimmers, mm-hmm. uh, and I think this is probably one of the earliest ones of going, oh, okay, that's um, that's a bit interesting. Uh, but what also I think is very interesting. So you know, you you've got that line, and William P- Hartnell performs it brilliantly. But also, it's you know, Barbara immediately cuts him off and goes, you know, not Barbara, you tax her, because that's the the goddess, the Aztec goddess that, yes. that she's uh, playing. Um, you know, she's, you know, she's determined, and um, you know, nothing, nothing is going to sway her. Mm. There is a sacrifice in part one. At the sacrifice, Barbara orders them to stop. Um, the man being sacrificed jumps off the ledge mm-hmm. and um, to kind of regain his honour. Yeah. Um, and as he as he jumps, the rain does come. <laughs> After this, um, the Toxel proclaims her to be a false goddess, and he vows to destroy her. So we have this first glimmer of threat to the characters. Mm-hmm. The Barbara's openly defied their beliefs, um, which is a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, um, the Toxel is the embodiment of this um, this backlash against um, what she's telling them. Um, so we have the villain <laughs> of the serial, yeah, kind of come forward now. And the Toxel is a very memorable character, isn't he? Um, all the characters in this story, the the co- the costume design is like brilliant, but they're 
each one's quite unique, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, um, yeah, the costume design, um, the effort they put in on the, on the constraints of the budget is pretty good. Um, episode two, The Warriors of Death. <laughs> so the Doctor's furious with Barbara, pointing out that she's defied their, their tradition, their religion, um, and most of all, it's jeopardised their chances of getting back to the TARDIS. It's an interesting perspective to have been in this position, because, like I said before, we look back on history and the, all, all the ways and traditions, and uh, kind of accept them uh, as how they were and what these cultures did. Um, but to have to face these things in the here and now, it's interesting to think how would we react? Would it be complete acceptance of their traditions, or would we would we impose our morals on them? Yeah, that's true, and that's what the, the story explores. But it also sort of explores um, the complexities of civilizations, and you know, I mean, just on the surface, of this scene where uh, where the Doctor is rebuking Barbara um, for what she's done, I think that, you know, again, this is a, a great scene. You know, William Hartnell is being really fiery. You know, just you know, sort of lacing into Barbara, if you like, of just going, you know, what you've done is just. You put us all in jeopardy, and what you're doing is absolutely ridiculous, you know. And then Barbara, you know, she realizes what she's done, and then you know she she gets upset. And then the Doctor, and again, it's it's William Hartnell performing this superbly well. He just turns it around, and he's very soft and gentle. And then you know, um, you know, going you know, so basically going well, you know, it's it's happened. It is what it is. We can only do what we can do, and. Um, and then you know start to concoct this political situation of um, of how you know how to get out of it, which is because we've got these two characters, which is uh, Latoxel, the high priest of sacrifice, who you mentioned, and we've got Ortlock, which is the high priest of knowledge. And this is this is really interesting. So you've got these these two characters who sort of embody. The two aspects of Aztec society, you know, the Ortlock, the high priest of knowledge, represents what Barbara admires with the Aztec civilization and what mm. she's trying to protect. And and then we've got Latoxel, who's the high priest of sacrifice, and he represents sort of the dark side of Aztec civilization, if you like. Um, so they both embody, you know, you've got um, the embodiment of civilization in these two characters. And then what Barbara has to do is play them off one another in order to get out of the situation so you've got that analysis of civilization as well um you know this story is actually covering quite a lot within um within four 25 minute episodes um but it's 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 really interesting and it's sort of well you cannot you know because civilizations are complex and what have you and can you have one without the other? Hmm. And as it's pointed out later on, these are ju- these are just two men. They don't represent the whole civilization as well. There's this great scene after that with um, Latoxel questioning Barbara's um, divinity, mm-hmm. um, and she she doesn't buckle, does she? She's like a really strong girl. <laughs> yeah. No. No. She does. She doesn't. She's so fantastic. And this is another thing as well, which uh, I really like about this story is no none of the main characters well none of the characters actually but focusing on the, the you know the TARDIS crew none of them um, come across as stupid in any way you know you get um, you know these are incredibly strong intelligent willful people and yeah it's a fantastic scene and as you said Barbara doesn't buck- buckle under the pressure that she's under and um, and even later on uh, Latoxil even says, you know, how how can I defeat her? She's she's too clever. Um, yeah, and it's it's it is a great scene. You do like it, mm. and I quite you know um, I like the actor who plays Latoxil. He plays it very well, um, and even his like his posture. He's got this very kind of gargoyle kind of pose that he does sometimes when he's lunging over. And... Well, he is sort of it, it is uh, very much sort of in line of Shakespeare's, you know, Richard the Third type thing. Um you know, that that sort of, you know, uh that hunched, sort of deformed evil figure. Um, you know, it's you know, it's a, it's a trope, but when it's when it when it's done well, 
um, and that is really down to the you know the, the actor performing it because I think you know something like that could easily be um, quite cheesy, uh, but actually on this occasion no, it's it's pitched perfectly and uh, you know you you, you know you rec- yes you recognise the trope of Shakespeare's Richard the Third type thing going on, but the actor who plays it does it does it brilliantly. Um, yeah, and it it's sort of it's on the it's just on the right side of sort of pantomime because anything I think you know it is so almost in the realm of mustache twirling f- uh, villain of well if he had one, um, but you know that sort of you almost want to boo and hiss him as soon as he comes onto the screen. But you know, he, but you do get, but the reason why it's um, he still poses a threat is because he you know. Again, it's the actor's performance, how he's written as well, but uh, but he's intelligent as well. Mm-hmm. You know, Barbara's intelligent, but so is he. He po- he poses a real threat. Yeah, there's a lot of moves and counter moves between him and Barbara. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I really want Aztecs the stage play. <laughs> oh, it needs to happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, we talked about that being a great scene with Barbara. How she's so strong. And after this is probably my favourite scene in the whole serial. It's Ian showing attacks uh, his fighting styles, <laughs> and he uses more cunning, and he defends him with his thumb. He yeah, defeats him with his thumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the Toxel walks in and doubts Ian's ability, so soon exploits um, Ian's victory over Ixter um, in a plan to put them against each other in combat. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I did. Lo- I did love that scene. It it, it is it yeah yeah down. it's uh, it is a great scene and I love how um, uh, you know the Ortlock his uh, his reaction to it again I think this is one of the things as well is that um, I think if this story was to be um, sort of if it was to be done now I suppose it would be you know Ryan's character who would be in Ian's position. You know this idea of you know a strong male character having to fight uh, another Aztec warrior, uh, but I think the way it would be played now would be you know probably a bit more comedic and and Ryan trying to get out of the situation. But mm. what we have here, I think, places it very much in the time of the early sixties because Ian, you know, he's this very capable, intelligent, uh, but but strong character. You know, it, it's funny because in the first episode. When he said, "Look, um, you you can be in charge of all our armies," uh, and you know to, to refuse such an honor would be very odd. The doctor tries to get Ian out of it, but Ian recognizes well if we go to, if we start arguing down that route, it would cause too many questions. And so he 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 takes the the initiative and in going, "It's it's too great an honor. I accept." Um, mm. And given the age, not only of William Russell, uh, but the character he was playing. You know, it's it. You know, Ian's character could have fought in the Second World War, and I think you know, th- just something that that crossed you know crossed my mind on the there the, with this uh, viewing of it and um, sort of ones in recent years, you know, because he doesn't shrink from having to defend himself. No, and that he... didn't occur to me. I thought, where has he learned all these fighting tricks? Just like the Coal Hill Arms down the road. <laughs> a few bar fights. Well, yeah, possibly. I mean, he, you know, he, that's sort of the possibility. But, you know, what comes across my mind is, you know, he, he potentially could have fought in the Second World War. So the Doctor's in the garden with Kameka. Mm-hmm. Um, he's kind of making his moves to get into the temple. But it turns out the Doctor's a bit of a flirt. <laughs> yes, he is. And um, I think, I mean, I love this story and, you know, what you were saying with what your favourite scene was and yeah I get it because it is it is absolutely fantastic but I think my favourite moment of the story is between the Doctor and Kameka I just think they're really delightful um, and William Hartnell plays plays it really well but yeah there is that sort of gentle flirting it is it is sort of played a bit for laughs but it is also quite sweet to watch um, yeah. but it also but it also adds a purpose narratively because there's a lot of danger and drama and this provides i think just a, a nice change of pace and a bit of uh, it provides a bit of um a nice change of pace yeah and i wonder what the doctor's intentions or feelings are because you could take it at face value like um he is romantically interested or you could um 
you could take it on some other level like um he's being more courteous and there is the the we're jumping ahead here but the engagement that he's not aware of and then he's not fully committed to either um there's a bit of uncertainty here about what the doctor's feelings are Mm -hmm. um do you think that i do think for the most part um i think i think the doctor does genuine genuinely like her uh and you know recognizes you know, in in the way that Barbara recognises Ortlock as, as someone quite special in Aztec society, the Doctor recognises Kameka as someone really um, special. You know, and it says in the first episode, even though he's talk, talking to, to Ian about her, he seems to be sort of talking to himself in a way, of, you know, when he's describing her as so, you know, warm and gentle and intelligent. Um, he does seem to be quite taken with her. But yeah, that scene later on when, when they get engaged, he's... He sort of recognises the importance of um, Aztecs making hot chocolate for each other, but yeah. I think he just thinks, "Oh, it's um, it's just a, it's just a, a way of uh, showing friendship," not realising actually it's it's a marriage proposal. Yes, <laughs> and again, that's just a great comic scene, you know, when uh, when Kameka says, "You know, I accept your gentle proposal," <laughs> and William Hartnell just, you know, you know his. Uh, because he's a, he's a great actor, and um, you know he he can play comic moments very well. We see you know see that in other stuff that he's done, but we we see it in Doctor Who, and just that that look <laughs> of shock on his face it's it, it it's brilliant. It did make me <laughs> laugh. Um, and yeah, the, there are moments in the scene where you're going, well, maybe he is fond of her, but is he sort of using her in order to get to the tomb? Because it turns out Kameka knew um, the man who built the temple. Yes, um, um, and that's something I was considering because the doctor, from the off, he's making his play to get back to the to the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. Um, why would he? Why would he sidetrack? Um, in this story, yeah, but um, um well, I don't because I don't want to leap ahead too much. But there's there's a there's a moment in the very final episode which I, which just tips it because I'm sort of going through the. I do think it, that there is a. There is a genuine thing between them, but yeah, you you mm. can see, you can read it either way. But there's a moment in the final episode where, um, yeah, tips it more one way than yeah, the other. Enough. But yeah, fair enough. We'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. Um. So anyway, Ixter is looking at his club, kind of dwelling on the attack from Ian. He kind of feels his back, so um, <laughs> he's feeling a bit um, inferior or insecure, or he's this great warrior, isn't he? Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, if you if you were this fantastic warrior, you know, you know, you were confident in your abilities, and you're that close to winning the ultimate honor of being in control of all the Aztec army, and someone's defeated you by just you know, giving you a tighter grip on the shoulder with a thumb, you would feel a bit of a chump. Mm-hmm. Um, Kameka comes to see him, and surprise, surprise! It turns out that Ixter is the builder's son, who the Doctor wants to meet. Mm-hmm. Susan's been made to study the code of the good housewife. Um, she also rebels against the idea of being told who she'll marry. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the the first part of Susan's narrative in the story. <laughs> yeah, it's true. She... Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, because it's just something I want to point out. Um, in because I don't know whether this is a story editor's th- thing. Or if it's just a coincidence that John Lucarotti happened to write both stories. But what's interesting is in the story Marco Polo, um, Susan befriends um, a young woman about her own age, about 16, called Ping Cho. And Ping Cho, she was forced into an arranged marriage. And Ping Cho and Susan become friends um, and that thing about being in a forced arranged marriage is is talked upon, is commented upon in Marco Polo. Mm. So um, so I, th- I find it interesting that it works on its own. You don't need to know this about Marco Polo. Um, it, you know, the, the character development and the threat of what later emerges in the Aztecs, Aztecs works if you just watch the story on its own. You don't need this prior knowledge, but I do think it's interesting that you have that uh, in Marco Polo, and now it sort of seems to be reflected in what Susan's going through in this story. 
So you think that had an effect on her in this story? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, Susan does kind of play along initially with the um, with the studying, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. She's um, after all, she she is a student at Cole Hill, quite a clever one, um, and she kind of relishes in the idea of learning about cultures, mm-hmm. and she takes it on board pretty well. But when um, the thing of the arranged marriage comes to, comes in, um, of course, she rebels against that. Um, yeah, yeah, because I think yeah, she's she's very capable and very interested in learning about you know different cultures and so on. But when it when um, when that culture which she doesn't agree with can potentially impinge upon her life, that's when she goes, no, I'm not having any of that. Um, you know, which is fair enough. Um, I'm not going to criticise Susan for that one. Um, but it, what's interesting is sort of in this story is that y- you have that moment um, where it's just sort of mentioned that um, if you do meet your future husband, you know, you, you must... You know, you cannot look at him. You must keep your eyes downcast. And she goes, well, how will I know? He goes, well, you will be told. I go, told? Told who to marry? Don't be ridiculous. And you just think it's... In some respects, you can just see it as just a, a throwaway scene. Because it's not really commented upon for quite a while. It only becomes relevant later on, you know, when um, when Latoxel realises, well, I can't attack Barbara directly. Her weakness lies in her companions. Yes, and that's when that one scene's picked up on, um, and you go, "Oh yeah, I remember that," and it, you know, and then it sort of spirals a bit, um, which I think is very good writing. You know, it doesn't feel like it's, it doesn't feel like it's massively foreshadowing something. No. So when it does, when it does get picked up, it just seems you know it flows quite well, and I like that. Yeah, it serves a purpose to get her in trouble further down the line. <laughs> yeah. So. Ixta comes to see the doctor in the garden and he agrees to give him drawings of the temple but he also seeks his help help to win the fight. It's worth pointing out here that the doctor is willing to meddle to get his own gain. Um, Does that have any bearing on the way Barbara wants to meddle? No, not really. Well, it's sort of interesting, sort of, well... It's the action that everyone has to take now because of Barbara's reaction. It goes back to that scene... You know, uh, when the doctor's rebuking her and then, you know, she gets upset. And, and then it's it's actually the doctor who says to Barbara, look, right, this is the situation we're in now. We can get out of it. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be on the ball and you're going to have to play Ortlock and Latox. Uh, yeah, Ortlock and Latox are off each other. In order for us to get out of the situation, you're now going to have to sort of like get your hands dirty and get, you know, make the situation political. So it's the doctor who, who you know, says that and then Barbara you know does that so it's sort of right this is a situation where this is what we're going to have to do in order for us to get the hell out of here and just get to the TARDIS and leave them to get on with it so I think it's uh, I think it's consistent we get a, a first good chat with Barbara and Ortlock she's asking him about his feelings of her actions he's open to accepting the changes and um, says that his faith in the gods won't falter Yes, it it shows a good difference of opinion between the individuals rather than giving this singular view of an entire culture, um, which I like. It gives some good dynamics. It's not just um, blind faith or disbelief. It's a very broad kind of outlook on the faith. It's kind of it's just human nature that we're being presented with, not just um, the view of one culture. You know, we've been a, a historical a historical story. They don't give it such a they don't brand it as one kind of view no no that's true and yeah it is it is sort of balanced they're going you know uh, the aztec civilization had you know many remarkable things uh but the things that you know we can you know we can be quite uh, horrified by you know it had um at the very heart of its civilization it had um you know violence at the heart of it you know is it you know was it forever doomed because of that and as you said well, as we both talked about, is that, you know, we got Latoxel as the High Priest of Sacrifice and he represents um, the savagery of the Aztec way of life. You know, he has a guarantee of power through the fear generated by sacrifice, um, if you like. Although, you know, the way, you know, sacrifice is seen as a, as a very honourable thing. You know, so if you're the, if you're the, you know, um, the person to be sacrificed, it was, it was deemed a great honour. 
uh, which is explained in the story. You know, we have the uh, the perfect victim. Uh, you know, and he is, um, you know, all his, you know, he's basically looked after for the the last few days of his life, and all wishes of his are guaranteed. Um, so you, you've got that thrust through the talk show. Then you have Ortlock, and he's the complete opposite. You know, he realizes human sacrifice is not necessary, but is simply a tool to rule. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what you know Barbara's action trying to play them off, you know, one another. I think you know it's uh, it's it's done really well, but again, this you know th- th- this sort of comment on the civilization itself—it's historical, so we, the audience, are learning about it, um, but we're also thinking and questioning it as well. So, it's it's very engaging on that. And um, Barbara does something quite brave. She gives Ortlock a prophecy, you know, the fate of the Aztecs, and she does promise a brighter future um, if they abandon the sacrifice. So she's made quite a gamble here. She's given them a lot of information about the future, mm. I guess, that the civili- civilization will be doomed. And kind of given them an, an ultimatum, you know, change or or die, really. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that, that is exactly what it is. And, um, I mean, yeah, because it was when Cortes lands uh, with the Spanish, their first reaction to the Aztecs was, um, yeah, it was a different civilization, but they there was, you know, they seemed to get on and be quite friendly. It was when, because obviously, keeping in mind, it's you know Western civilization and you know Catholic, when, you know, and I, you know, it's the, I think the reaction that we would have if we saw it, you know, the human sacrifices, and mm. uh, seeing inside the you know the temple, they freaked out and thought. You know this civilization is is evil and needs to be destroyed, and that's what happened. So what uh, so what Barbara's saying is true. You know if you got rid of the sacrificial element of your society, um, everything would be hunky dory. So when the Spanish arrive, um, a few years down the line, uh, they're not going to be freaked out and everything will be fine. But of course, it's the big question though. It's like what what I was saying before is that, but it, you know that that thing that she's questioning and you know finds apparent is at the heart of. Aztec society, yes, there are, uh, you know, there are things that you can admire about it, but it's 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 all one and it all ties in, mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's sort of interesting because we we uh, one of my favourite scenes is um, uh, I think it's in the final episode. It's between Barbara and Ian, uh, who haven't had that much interaction in the story um, because of because of where they've been placed and what they've been doing. But then you realise, sort of like, well, Barbara's perception has been that Ortlock is the chap who represents Aztec society as it is, and uh, Latoxel's the odd man out. But it's actually Ian who goes, look, if you were able to step back and observe things objectively and experience, you know, things on the ground like we have, you'll realise, actually, no, Ortlock's the odd one out he's the remarkable one he's the one who's able to you know t- to listen and consider things um it's it's latoxel who sort of represents the way things are going and you know um i like that scene a lot and it, again it's sort of you know it's it's coherent the story a bit and it, you know it's sort of like one of those scenes where it goes it's a great moment of realization and it's a great it's great character interaction but it, but in a really interesting, engaging way, it basically goes, and this is what the story's about. Um, is it a bit arrogant to come in and say, look, your religion is false? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's not questioned enough here between the characters. No, it's true. You can have that point of view, but I think also, I think we can, you know, I think we... We can also be quite objective. I think, you know, if you encounter a civilization which has, you know, which has institutional violence embedded within it to the point where you know it sacrifices you know humans yes it rages all it, yes it raises uh, interesting philosophical questions but at the same time i think um I, th- I think we can say well if your society seems to feel that it's perfectly acceptable to sacrifice humanity um it's yeah I think, you know, I think we're safe to question that. But yeah, you are right, because what's interesting is that, you know, when, you know, with Western civilization and, you know, with um, mainly with the main Abrahamic, you know, the, the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, one of the one of the most important stories is when 
uh, you know, God basically says you you know one of the biggest one of the biggest changes here with believing in you know the, uh, believing in the one true God is that um, you no longer have to do human sacrifice. You know, um, you know, because that you know that's in that's in the Torah, that's in the Bible, that's in the Quran. So, and obviously, you know, Bar- Barbara's coming from, you know, Western civilization. I only mention this because it, you know, th- and because it ties into also what you know, Cortes and the Spanish when they arrived and when they encountered the Aztecs, um, coming from from that philosophical religious perspective. I think you know it's totally understandable that so well. You know, um, we have for hundreds, thousands of years, you know, been taught that human sacrifice is not necessary. It's actually an evil, um, and you're encounter you're encountering it here. Obviously, you are going to be appalled by it. Yes, I guess um, each society's perspective is relative to their own um, beliefs, and mm-hmm. I guess um, Barbara's determination here, even though. Um, she's right to say it's wrong it it does come out of this um this arrogance mm-hmm. to yeah. um to not accepting other people's beliefs yeah blind me the story's deep <laughs> the doctor gives Ixta the means to defeat ian <laughs> you know uh, a cactus needle on a leaf yeah um <laughs> um mind ian does start to get sleepy pretty quick doesn't he must be a very effective poison it's very yeah. effective yeah <laughs> Um, if you could bottle that and market it you'd make a fortune <laughs> um, mind when the doctor walks in and says Ian don't let him scratch you <laughs> Ian's like what and he gets distracted and then he gets scratched now that... if the doctor hadn't said anything maybe not right yeah I, I do think that I think that's I mean it's fine you sort of accept it but I do think if I, if I am going to quibble with something in this, because uh, we're being too, far too complimentary, and this podcast probably getting boring as a result of it. Um, if I am going to quibble about something, it is that scene, because um, you are right. Um, but then at the same time, you sort of you can recognise why the Doctor would, you know, try and warn Ian. It's more how it's more the problem I have with it is more how that scene is staged, and I think they would probably rush because. William Russell, you know, he he's in this strange stance with his wrists on display, in a way that no one would ever do if they were fighting. And he yeah. just goes, "What?" And then you got this big, <laughs> this big dramatic. And ah, now I've scratched you across the wrist in a very obvious way, yeah. uh, in front of everyone, even though it's supposed to be this this covert uh, move. Um, this this um, scene was basically written for the stage play, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. But, I mean, I'm not really bothered, you know, but I think if I was to quit, I went, oh, that could have been staged and directed a little bit better, but... And then doesn't the Doctor say something like, um, he he's used the drugs, I mean, the magic that I gave him. Yes. <laughs> he says that to um, the Toxel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and why, then, why specify the magic? <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the Toxel later on goes, this is magic, it's juice from a plant. <laughs> but, but then, um, but Ixta already knew that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, anyway, moving on to episode three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, oh yeah, because this cliffhanger is fantastic. What was the cliffhanger in? I think episode two. Ian gets. Oh yes, Barbara enters the room. Yeah. It is a very rushed scene. <laughs> they just throw everyone in the scene. Yeah, but I, I I just think it's great because I think I mean I like the the cliffhangers of of the story. Uh, oh, I think I know what you're getting at. But th- but this one's my favourite. When um, Barbara raises a blade to the well, Toxel's neck. Well, that the, right? well, that's in the that's in the that's in the following episode when she gets out of the the predicament. But the, the, the right. Oh yes. The Sorry. Cl- yes. I'm yeah. Yeah. No, no. No. It's fine. So the cliffhanger is which you've just ruined. But I'm sure listeners have probably already watched the story. So um, the cliffhanger is um, Ian is about to be killed. Barbara walks into the room, and then the Toxel says, "If you really are your taxer, save him." And then you know, and then you just got this this close up of Barbara going, you know, how the hell am I going to get out of this one? And I just think it's a fantastic cliffhanger. It's just a moment of real drama, and you're going, yeah, how is she going to get out of this one? And then, as you said, 
in the following episode, she just uses her intuition. She acts instantly, but it, I think it's very well done. Yes. She grabs a yeah. knife, holds it to uh, the Toxel's throat, and goes, "If you if you kill Ian, I'm going to kill him as well." And then, yeah, you know, it's it's, it's she, great. She, she justifies that pretty well because doesn't she say like, um, "Why should I use divine intervention when human actions will suffice?" Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, which is a great line. It uh, and you you can understand why Ortlock would accept that and goes you know because you can. What did everyone expect? A miracle? <laughs> which is almost comedic when she says that. Uh, but Ortlock, you know, says um, well we all expected it and says that line that you just said. Uh, and yeah, you you, you <laughs> again Barbara, you know she's uh, she goes, oh bloody good you know, bloody good line. Mm. Um, then we'll have a bit of. Um... Bit of an issue with Barbara here. Um, Ortlock appeals to Barbara not to deceive him. And oh, she questions yeah, yeah. The, the sacrifice and the eclipse. Um, and I think we see a bit of guilt on her face here. <laughs> um, but yes, she she relates to Ortlock and respects his views, but she's having to deceive him. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Isn't there a scene in the garden as well after this um, when Latoxel's in the garden with the doctor? <laughs> um does the doctor say that she's a false goddess at this point too? No, no, he doesn't. But he implies it. He sort of, well, he, he sort of implies it because we, in the, we the audience, know the truth. Um, and at this point, you know, uh, Latoxel has his doubts, but nothing's been sort of, co- you know, you know, nothing's been concretely said, but he's having this interaction with a doctor. And again, I think again, this is uh, a very well written scene. You know, because you know, the talks are going. You know, you're very, you know, there's something odd about you. You, you know, for a servant, you know, there's something about you. I just, ah, uh, uh, you know, who are you? You know, what do you represent? And then he, you know, says, I represent the truth. And if you help me you'll find it so we the audience know what that means which is basically going well yeah if you if you help you'll find out your suspicions are correct but mm. we'll be out of here by that point um but yeah it's it, it's uh it, it's a it's a really well written scene you know where you've got um where you've got the villain of the story trying to understand you know one of the main characters it's uh yeah it's great ian wakes up um with Ixta there with him, and a new an interesting friendship is born here. Um, Ixta is <laughs> quite, quite an honourable honourable person for the most part, and he feels no need to deny Ian the respect that he would treat a fellow warrior. Yeah. So yes, um, he, he's not going to just kill him outright, which is interesting. Yeah, but I, the bit that I love about that scene, so it's just going, you know, we we can you know we can be friends. <laughs> and it's like right, okay, whatever. And then, oh, uh, and then Latoxel comes in, says something, and then Ian's going, "Don't tell me you're going to be my friend now." Oh yes. And his reaction is just priceless. It cracked me up. I thought it was hysterical. Just, <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. I hadn't watched that scene again. It was just superb. Just Latoxel's reaction to that is just. Please, uh, listeners, go back and watch that scene. Just Lat- <laughs> Latoxel's look on his face. It's just. It's priceless. I just thought. I just thought it was a. I just thought it was a brilliant, brilliant brilliantly comic. Um, we do have a scene with Barbara and Ian together. Barbara's telling Ian of the differences between Ortlock and Utoxol, mm-hmm. um, Latoxol. Um, but Ian implores with her that they're all the same, and you know Ortlock is just one man. Um. So Barbara begins to see that she probably can't change them. So she has a bit of doubt here. Mm-hmm. But there we go. That's, um, there's there's Ian's perspective of it all right there. Yeah, yeah. As I said before, I, I, I love that scene. Um, if I had to pick one scene that's my favourite, I think it's probably that one. The Toxel brings the poison to Barbara. And, uh, and she asks him to drink it first to prove um, his belief for her. Of course... He won't drink it, which reveals that it was poison. Mm-hmm. Um, and after this, um, she proclaims herself to be a fake, which was a very brave move. Yeah, I, again, it's sort of, um, it raises uh, the drama because now everything's out in the open now, and uh, you can kind of see why. You know, 
Barbara said it, you know, it's out of, you know, frustration because she's constantly being tested and tested and tested because uh, the situation that she's placed everyone in. Um, you know, and she, she very nearly did drink the poison. It's only the fact that Ian in the background, you know, unbeknownst... Oh, waving, yes. Yeah, waving oh. unbeknownst to uh, the Toxel that, you know, he's there saying, you know, don't drink it, that's the, you know... And then she goes, you know, um, you know, as, as you have my faith in you, you, your faith in me or whatever, something along those lines. He goes, you drink it. Um, yeah, and you just, you get that real moment of... Uh, it's sort of one of those moments where it had it been played slightly differently, you know, you could maybe she would have got out of it. Because uh, there was that thing of going, well, I knew it was poison. And yeah, you were going to test me, but because I know, doesn't that prove that I am the god of knowledge? But you kind of go... Mm. There's always that question, go, what would happen if she played her that way? But you can kind of get the sense of frustration, go, no, it would have killed me. And it just raises the drama even more. And it, it um, everything's out in the open now, as I said. And uh, again, it raises the stakes. It's, um, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's a great moment in of itself and played very well. But it also has impact for the story. It, I do feel like it, it makes Lutoxel potentially more dangerous and more determined. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kameka tells the Doctor about Ix's father, uh, who she was once in love with, and disappeared in that very garden. Mm -hmm. And Ix's father being the designer or the architect or the builder of the tomb. Mm -hmm. um, and we can presume that he had entered this aqueduct at some point. Through the um, through the stone. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of. Um, I mean, I remember as a kid watching this. I, I never picked up on that. I just went, "Oh, he vanished, and maybe he was kidnapped. <laughs> maybe he was killed. Maybe he decided to go for a walk and never came back." I never well, picked possibly, up. Yeah. yeah, I never picked up on the fact that it was supposed to be. No, he he. Yeah, <laughs> obviously now I watch it and I pick up on that. Um, I, so I've matured yeah. somewhat, and I I pick up on these things a little bit better. But yeah. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little bit of backstory there. Yeah, but what happened to him? Um, I was thinking, did he just go in there to die? <laughs> um, but then when I thought about it a bit more, um, perhaps he went in to um, kind of maybe loot the tomb a bit more, um, as he possibly had, because he had that coin from Utax's tomb. Um what if he went in and then the flood got him? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's the most likely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's what I pick up on the fact because yeah, because it's interesting that you know she's got this token which came from inside the tomb. So obviously mm. he'd been in, <laughs> looted it a bit, and decided to go back. Yeah, but I think uh, I think it's inferred quite strongly that you know he he probably did drown. The tax will further manipulates Barbara by saying. There's a they're going to discipline Susan, but he doesn't explicitly say it's her. Uh, yeah, and again, that's just that that wonderful evil moment. I mean, you know, when Barbara quite innocently goes, you know, I want I want everyone there, including Susan. And then, then oh yeah, and then just going, yes, they'll all be there, including <laughs> her. And it's just, <laughs> just going, yeah, because you're the one she you're planning to. Go. <laughs> But it's, I mean, it's an obvious thing to do for the film, but it's just a great moment. He's just gone, oh, you evil toe rack. But yeah, it's it's great. And, uh, again, the actor just plays that part really, really well. It's, you know, it's great. It's typical evil stuff, but yes, you can't help but love it. It, uh, it works really well. <laughs> um, the Doctor brings Ian the coin um, with you tax the symbol on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just agree that there must be a tunnel to the tomb from the garden. You know, they just come to that conclusion. Fair enough. Um, well, I think what I, I, I can I know what you're saying. I can sort of buy it because it's it's this sign of going well. Um, the symbol of your tax or wherever that is is of importance. And then the doctor's going well because we've seen him inspected before he received that token. Because um, mm. he so he knows that there's something special about that particular slab. And this little thing is going, yeah, I think this is... So I can kind of buy he would come to that conclusion. Um, but the best moment here, I think you'll agree, is when the Doctor reveals that he got her from his fiancée. <laughs> yes. So it was nice to see Ian laugh for a change. Nice bit of humour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> just casually dropped his gun. Where did you get this? Oh, just my fiance. <laughs> he just goes, oh, I see. <laughs> Yo, what? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's 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 a nice, light-hearted comic moment, and uh, both actors play it really well. I in think, retrospect, yeah. I think we would have loved a bit more humour in this. <laughs> more moments like this. Yeah, I think um, yeah, probably because um, it, it it is it is those moments between the Doctor and Kameka which you know provide that uh, levity that the story needs. But then, but then. Because of the way that things progress, even that becomes sad. Um, you know, it's, but we'll we'll get to that. So episode three's coming to a to an end soon. The Doctor and Ian remove the stone, the polystyrene stone, and <laughs> and Ian enters the passage. But um, Ix has been watching the whole time. Yeah. Um, he approaches and replaces the stone. Um. Revealing that it it comes from the river in the mountains, is that right? It's some kind of aqueduct, um, and it would flood the garden otherwise. So you know, he closes it. Yeah. Um, and the doctor's pretty helpless to um to stop him. <laughs> I mean, it's only polystyrene, doctor. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, I've got to give all credit to the actors trying to act like that thing's heavy when clearly it isn't. That's difficult. Um, yeah. And I. Th- Actually, I think I think this is one occasion where the actor playing Ixter is better at doing it than William Russell is. I guess so, yeah. So yes, the the whole place starts to flood. Although it doesn't look like much of a bad flood, does it? No, well, not to begin with. But I mean, if that thing's just left, obviously it's going to rise. <laughs> but at the moment, yeah, at that moment, it's just splashing his feet. Yeah. Which and we get a close up. The doctors frantically say, "No, Ian Chesterton's in there," and all this. <laughs> So Ian finally enters the tomb. Mm-hmm. He didn't get washed away after all. Um, he ties the rope to the door mechanism so mm-hmm. they can return through. Yeah. Then he goes through. And um, shortly after this, Ian goes off to rescue Susan. Mm-hmm. And I like that moment where he, he surprises Ixter from behind. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good. Knocks him out. So finally, the four of them are reunited um, in the Itaxis Gate of Throne Room. <laughs> and um, they try to reopen the tomb, but they don't have any luck. The Doctor needs a pulley, mm-hmm. but they don't exist. No, yeah, because um, the Aztecs never invented the wheel. Oh. Which is weird when you come to think of it. It's uh, it's one of those things that we take, and I think we take for granted that the fact that you know the wheel had to be well, obviously the wheel had to be invented, but we take a, such a thing for granted now as something really basic. I mean, because you know the you know the animated series Futurama. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that they had they had this idea that um, it was going to be obviously this futuristic technological uh, civilization, but they thought they would have this idea, but they never invented the wheel. That that was one of the ideas, uh, mm. but you could, see, but you can even even with that idea, there's, they can't really do it because you see all these round things uh, in the series. Uh, to the idea, well, obviously they must have invented the wheel. Uh, it's just one of those things. So the fact that I had a civilization which didn't invent it, it just boggles my mind. Really interesting. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's me just waffling on. Carry on. It's fine. <laughs> Well, the Toxel plans to set up Ian. He gets Ixter to strike Ortlock with his club. Um, annoyingly, though, Ian and Susan go to the garden. They're going to enter the passageway, but unfortunately, Ian falls straight into the trap. Not only did they find Ian's club, but they found Ian holding it as well. Yeah, I mean, because he even says, this must be a trap, but I'll still hold <laughs> on to the damn thing and stand up waving it around. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know you would you would drop that instantly and run, but yeah, it was it was all clearly set up. But um, yeah. but the big thing is because at the, you know as the, the course of the episode is has been well as the course of the story's been going on, um, Ortlock has obviously been having his doubts, but the fact that he's now supposedly been attacked by one of the servants of Yataxter, now he proclaims that Barbara's false. Yes. So now they you know now they really need to get out of here. They've got no one on their side now. Yeah. 
I mean, I know that was Lutoxel's intention, mm-hmm. but Ortlock came to that conclusion pretty quick. Yeah, that's true. But I think um, you know, th- as the story's been progressing, you know, th- there is that there's one particular moment in the story where he goes, you know, he completely believes in her, but then he would have to, st- you know, given the way that certain things have been progressing, he would have to start questioning. And now the fact that he's just been he's just been violently attacked, you know, I do think it, you know, it's plausible that it would completely shake his, you know, his 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 view on things and going. You know, this is uh, this is nonsense. But what's mm. interesting again is the way that his character de- de- develops, um, and actually, because in many ways the story is without hope, but what happens to Ortlock does give a bit of a glimmer of that. Mm. But again, we'll we'll get to that towards the end. So the Doctor begins making the pulley in the garden, and Kameka now seems to be aware that at some point. The doctor and her will part ways. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because she says, "I don't know what this is, um, but I've got a, a feeling that it's going to result in you leaving me." Ortlock also comes to see Kameka, and of course, it appears that he's gone into like an exile or a re- retreat. Mm-hmm. Um, and he asks Kameka to free Susan, just his final act in the story. Yeah. So Kameka tries to kind of bribe the guard to get Susan and Ian to safety. Um, Ian strikes the guard from behind, um, but Kameka leaves the wealth of Orlok with the guard anyway, which was a nice touch. Yeah. Kameka brings Susan back to the doctor on the summit, and um, she wishes to stand by the doctor's side, but um, he refuses to face her. She understands and asks him to think of her. So do you think the fact that the, the Doctor can't face up to this and keeps his back to her, do you think it's, it's a sign that his feelings are the same but he refuses to um, indulge in these feelings? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very emotionally wrought because he, he thanks her whilst facing her, you know, the fact that she brought Susan at great risk to herself. You know, mm. uh, but it's that moment where, you know, I'll stand by your side and then he, he can't yeah, as you say, can't can't face her, and uh, yeah, um, it is a it is a heart, you know it is a heartbreaking scene because I think it is, you know I think it's one of those things. Yeah, we you know take it at face value. The doctor you know uh, does have strong feelings for her, and and you know and can't face it, and that fact, and then she accepts it with with grace and dignity, you know, but just saying, but well, just think of me. That's all I can ask. Just think of me. Oh, it's you know, it's brings a tear to your eye. Yeah, Yeah. it really is. That guard that was guarding Susan, Mm -hmm. um, Ixter kills him. Yep. Um, we don't see the kill and blow. We just see him raise his club. But yeah, we're we're at this point in the story now where you know things are really you know picking up a pace where we're coming to the end of it now. Everyone's in a in a desperate desperate situation to to win. So obviously yes. we've got the, the, the TARDIS crew who are desperate to get out. I mean, they have to, because otherwise they're going to be brutally killed. Um, and then you've got Ortlock and everyone else rallying around who are trying to, you know, to get things, you know, get the status quo back into place and all the rest of it. And, so, you know, they're desperate. You know, things, so things are really picking up. And again, I think that the pacing of the story is really quite good. And especially now, you know, things are, are happening very quickly. I think it's when Barbara approaches the altar, Lutaxel lifts his blade to strike Barbara, doesn't he? And um, thankfully, Ian stops him, and he shouts for Ixta. We hear his, we hear his voice bellowing like kind of down through the city, and Ix- Ixta hears. So Ian kind of guards the the door to the the throne room and the tomb, um, where the others use the pulley, yeah, to get the door open. And then Ixta approaches the big battle. <laughs> Quite a big fight at the end. So that was a good scene. Yeah, yeah, I thought I thought it was a good scene. A nice, uh, you know, uh, a nice bit of uh, action. Because this is this is more this story is more of a straight drama in many ways. But we've got this um, this fight. What's interesting is that uh, Derek Ware was one of the stunt coordinators for this. And he, so obviously he, he, well, he was an actor slash stuntman 
slash stunt arranger. And he he actually would later perform quite heavily in the John Pertwee era because he was one of the people who uh, founded Havoc. Oh, right. Okay. Who was the group of stuntmen that were used quite heavily during the uh, the John Pertwee era. So I just thought, you know, g- give him a shout out. So he, he's involved in Doctor Who at a very early, uh, very early stage. Um, so yeah, he arranges this fight, and it's, you know, it's it's quite well handled. Yeah, it's quite um, heavy handed. It's mainly the um, the clubs and the shields. <laughs> yeah. But after this brutal fight, Ian throws Ixter off the precipice of the the temple. Yeah. And he falls to his death. And we'll see him kind of squirming on the floor and finally die. And, um, and then we have this nice moment where Ian stands alone on the summit, takes his helmet off and takes one, one last look towards the, this lost kingdom. Mm-hmm. And then turns and uh, the tomb door opens. So finally, they've got to safety. Yeah, but again, I think it, it, it's again very, very nicely done the way that, that, that you know, even... Even getting to the the TARDIS at that this late state in the story was you know was very high risk because no sooner have they got in, uh, the Toxel and all the guards just arrive, as well. So they've just escaped with the skin of their teeth. So again, you know, so th- throughout this entire story, even right up to the end, uh, that sense of danger was just constant. It never let up. Like you said, the Toxel enters with the guards, but he has more pressing matters, so he decides to let them go. Yeah, because I think you know as well they've gone now. I don't have to consider them. The status quo is now back in place. Right, I can now, <laughs> I can now get on my job by killing people, uh, and th- that's what he does. So the, the, one of the, it's not the last thing we see, but the the last thing that we see in the main uh, location of the story is him, you know, raising his knife up to kill the perfect victim. And unfortunately, I Barbara stands in the tomb telling the Doctor that she's failed. Yeah. Um, the Toxel won, and she betrayed the one man that he trusted, Ortlock. But the Doctor insisted that they had to fail, and mm-hmm. that she's actually helped Ortlock find a new path. Yeah. So, so some good has come out of this. Yeah, and that's the that's what I was talking about before when I was saying you know there's that little bit of glimmer of hope at the end of going right. Yeah, they completely failed, but you know, but they they had to. Um, but actually, it's through their actions that they saved. You know, one man, which was Altlock. Yeah. And actually, that's a very, that's something. You know, it's there. It's here in the the, the Aztecs. But you know, when you think about it, you know, it's it's there in the in the modern era of Doctor Who in much greater abundance. But it's it's here in the Aztecs. The Aztecs got here first, if you like. Does it really well? But you know, it's sort of interesting. You know, when you look at you know stories like the Fires of Pompeii. You know, th- mm-hmm. that was the thing at the end, and it's it's. Um, it's actually the companion who goes, you know, can't we just save one person? You know, and they say Peter Capaldi. Um, you know, but it's that thing of going, you know, if you, you know, if you, you know, it's sort of that, that thing, you know, if you save one life, you save the world entire. And that's the glimmer of hope that this story has. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's quite nice. But then we also have, I think, quite an, a, a nice touching moment as well. You know, we've got the Doctor who's handling the the token that Kameka gave her he puts it down about to walk away and then and then turns back snatches it back up and sna- uh, stuffs it in his pocket and then goes into the TARDIS mm-hmm. and for me that's the, the the final selling point of going you know he, he did genuinely care for her that's a nice touch but yeah I think yeah that, that is a nice touch but it's um it's an interesting story because it's um, there's very you know it's it's actually quite a very serious drama and there's no as I said there's no let up in the in the pace and the the constant threat but it's like everyone everyone is doomed in this story even Kameka in the final episode when she's commenting upon the whole of Aztec society and you're saying you know she, even she says we are do we are a doomed people there is no turning back for us hmm. and it's. You know, it's she. You know, she recognizes that, and we know. You know, that when we see uh, the fact that the last thing that we see of an Aztec person in this story is um, Latoxel sacrificing somebody, you could argue. Well, is this John Le- 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 um, John Lucarotti actually making a comment of that? 
you know, given what Aztec society civilization was like, and it had this thing at the very heart of its its uh, society, that the only logical conclusion was was for that form of violence and brutality to just go more and more and more. You know, the fact that Barbara says, you know, I foresee a time when, you know, a thousand people will be killed in one day. You know, is this John Lucarotti's comment of going, you know, that was the logical conclusion. It could, you know, the fact that this society had this at its heart, it could only go that, you know, possibly. Maybe we're looking too much into it, but there's an awful lot Maybe. in this. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. but there is an awful lot in this story and it, it is very interesting. But at, but at the end, um, the fact that, you know, we have, you know, you saved Ortlock, that's nice. The Doctor, you know... Um, Yes, it's sort of heartbreaking in some respects, but you know we, you know we saw the Doctor form a bond with some somebody, which means an awful lot to him. You know that's quite nice, and that's how the the story ends. I know we joked earlier that um, it would make a good stage play, <laughs> but I think I, I would love to see this as um, like a cinematic retelling of the story. Um, we've had two Dalek movies. Um, Although I can't really imagine Roy Castle and Jenny Linden's version, Sabine and Barbara, um, overcoming the challenges in this story that this story presented um, with the characters. It's not to say that those characters aren't capable of great things, it's just um, the two versions hardly compared to the. <laughs> no, no, I mean, um, they are completely different. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the, the. I mean, having Roy Castle, I mean, he plays a more comedic version of the end, doesn't he? Even though you can just play joking about it, saying, you know, you could do a stage version of this. But, I mean, you could, but it would be more, um, you know, a serious stage play. Because th- there are, you know, you know, saying that uh, Latoxel has this sort of Richard Third Shakespeare thing going on. But, actually, there are there are quite a few moments in this where the dialogue did feel, you know, very Shakespearean. There's a scene where, um, you know, Latoxel is... Um, he is trying to arrange um, Ixter to have a fight with Ian, and what he does is he uses the perfect victim, who's all you know, whose every grant has to be, you know, every wish has to be granted. Mm-hmm. Um, that whole scene with uh, the Toxel Ixter and the perfect victim, the way that that scene is written, if you just listen to the dialogue, uh, and I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating or whatever i generally mean this i think the dialogue in that scene is very shakespearean um you know it's the, the writing in the story is that good right inspired uh, or incidental uh, well it, yeah i mean it's it's probably i mean it may be inspired by by shakespeare but there's something about you know uh, i'm picking on that scene because that's what i think that's the scene where it stands out the most um just the way just the way that the lines are written and obviously how everyone performs it uh, heightens it as well but um, the writing of, of, of the story is just excellent it's really really good so over on Twitter we started a poll today how would you describe the Aztecs fantastic quite good okay or poor and 57% voted fantastic 32 quite good 7% okay and 4% poor. Who are these people? <laughs> Who are these idiots? Jeez. They are fair enough, each their own, but it's. Uh, I can understand how some people may. I mean, because it's. I mean, if you compare it to modern modern day television, it's it, the, the pacing of the story, even though I was commenting on how it's quite good, which I, I, I do think it is, but compared to modern television, it is at a much slower pace. Yeah. So. Uh, Maybe it's coming from that perspective. I can see how people would say, you know, yeah, it's okay. But it's poor. black and white. Some people might think that's just unbearable. <laughs> oh, these idiots. <laughs> I don't even notice. No, it's... Um, I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not bothered with it. Because I know some people uh, do have an... You know, if, if, if something's in black and white, they just cannot engage with it. Uh, which I think is a shame. Because I think um, black and white television... And black and white uh, films can have uh, an atmosphere and a style which is unique to the fact it is black and white. I still find it engaging. If the story is engaging and the acting is good, mm-hmm. I'm not bothered whether it's black and white or not. 
I mean, there are like if there was a black and white, you know, if Lawrence of Arabia had been filmed in black and white, I think oh, no, that wouldn't have worked. The fact that you know it is this brilliant film, the fact it's in color makes the cinematography and everything work. Um, mm. But then, of course, if it was designed to be in color, if it was black and white, they probably would have done a different approach. But mm. anyway. So over to listeners' responses. Um, the Elizabeth Sladen um, tribute page on Instagram said, I love it. I feel like it was really ahead of its time to have a story that was not only focused mainly on a companion, Barbara, but also to have one that establishes such a defining trait of the show in that you can't change fixed points in history. That's still such an important principle in the show, mostly, um, that it abides to. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, it does. You know, th- that focus on the co- uh, on the companions has done really, really well. Uh, it's like what I said before. The other thing is, you know, is if you save one life, that's important, and that's you know, that's very much a part of a modern era. It's certainly from the David Tennant era onwards, uh, and that uh, and that's here as well. So yeah, I think that's, I think that sums it up quite well. Over on Twitter, the universe of Who said, Hey, hope you're all staying safe. The Aztecs is one of my favourites from the Hartnell era. Jacqueline Hill gives us her best performance as Barbara, and it's one of my favourite stories of classic Who. All the companions get their bits to do, and the villain is exceptional. 8 out of 10. Uh, Yeah, I think that's... uh... Well, yeah, we'll start off, yeah. um, We are staying safe, so uh, thanks for that. Hope you are as well. Yeah, it's it's certainly one of the... Th- yeah, I would say it's definitely one of my favourites from the Hartnell era. I think it's probably one of my all-time favourites in general anyway. I think it's that good. Yeah, Jacqueline Hill's brilliant. And yeah, it is... It, it does focus on her, but as you say, everyone gets their bit to do. And yeah, the villain is exceptional. Yeah, he's brilliant. Again on Twitter, Cheeky Monkey Picture said, The artistic high point for season one Everything comes together. Costumes, dialogue, plot, character, performances, makeup, sets, everything. Yeah, I think it's it, it's a bit of a shame that Marco Polo doesn't exist um, for, for us to watch. I think it'd be interesting to compare because they're both epic stories in, in slightly different ways. But Marco Polo was, uh, you know, was a much longer story. The Aztecs is uh, four episodes. But yeah, it, you know, the only, the only reason why I mention that is, you know, that comment going, you know, it's the the artistic high uh, high point of of season one. If we could see Marco Polo, I wonder whether we would still think that. But but it is what it is. We can't watch it. But yeah, as it is, I totally agree with that. Greg Campbell on Twitter said, "The perfect historical story, ten out of ten. Doctor Who, sheer brilliance. Also, Barbara's finest story. The scenes between Barbara and the Doctor in the Aztecs are an utter joy." Cannot recommend highly enough. Yeah, I agree with that. The scenes between the the, uh, the Doctor and Barbara, as we commented on earlier, are, are really well are really well done, and and they convey an awful lot. You know, the, the the moments you know when the Doctor is rebuking Barbara at the same time comforting her and supporting her and giving her information, uh, which are scattered throughout the um, story, are are superb. Steve Hyatt on Twitter said, "Splendid story." It looks far more expensive than it probably was, and it provided a nice bit of pocket money for my late and much-missed friend Ian Cullen, who paid extra, selling signed pics on eBay and doing conventions. An accomplished actor, this was one role that stayed with him. Oh, wow. Um, Well, thank you very much for uh, telling us that. I think that's... Yeah, that's that's lovely. I think he was... I mean, um, again, if you've got the Aztecs DVD... One of the special features is Ian Cullen being interviewed, and you know he talks about his career, but he talks about obviously playing playing this role and how it did stick with him. And yeah, he 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 is brilliant. Uh, I mean, every everyone is. I think this is this is one story which is very well cast. Um, but yeah, he, he he's excellent. He's one of those that certainly, obviously, I think uh, Latoxel sticks with you because he's the villain. You know, he's got that distinctive makeup. Um, uh, but Ian Cullen sticks with you. He he gave a very rich performance in this. Um, you know, he feels like a very grounded, 
real person and it's a, a very naturalistic performance in what is actually you know uh, which which blends in but what is largely quite a um a heightened shakespearean drama in some respects as i've said um um and there are many many lovely moments you know he poses a you know he poses a physical threat in the story you know his interactions between him and ian are really well done but there are those those moments you know he goes i don't see you as a threat anymore and you know you're my friend you know what you were commenting on earlier rob um yeah um so thanks very much for sending that in that's uh, that's lovely so a quick conclusion from me and Lee. Considering the, the limitations in production, it was a very good story. Lush backdrops, as we mentioned, and great scenery giving a huge sense of scope. Um, great costumes, of course, um, amazing performance. And I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but great camera work as well. Mm-hmm. Not just locked off cameras, but um, the handheld style we have. Um, the direction of the scenes, with the position of the characters, with some in the foreground, some in the background, is done very well. Um, most notably the final scene in the tomb of the Doctor and Barbara where the Doctor is in the background by the TARDIS out of focus talking to Barbara and then he walks forward into focus um, I think some of the direction here was brilliant yeah the, the direction was was fantastic I think um, it's a, one of, the, one of the, the good moments I think which either, there's a bit where um, the Doctor is talking to um, Kameka in the garden you know you've got all these these other Aztecs people in the background trying to listen to another conversation and you know the doctor just you know just looks and <laughs> basically saying it's a private conversation can you start off please and then they just, just do and, away. and they just sort of like shuffle off but it's um, the way that that is shot is is actually quite modern uh, and is, is really good there's another moment in I mean keeping how keeping in mind how how massive, how bulky, how cumbersome these cameras were to move. Mm. There's a scene, you know, when uh, when Ian enters the tomb. Yes. Um, so we begin at the, the top of where the um, the remains are. So the the top of the tomb, where the remains of uh, the Aztec priest are, looking at this brilliantly uh, detailed Aztec mask, and then the camera just sort of, you know pans up and away and then we see uh ian emerge from beneath the tomb uh from from beneath the um thing beneath the table yeah 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 and you know th- that shot i mean it's it's a basic camera move but it works really well but when you consider you know how how cumbersome these cameras were you know something as basic as that just you know impresses even more but uh but it's great I mean, um, when I'm watching the Aztecs, I'm not aware of sort of the technical limitations that they may have had. It's just good, well-made television. So down to a score, I found this a bit of a tricky one. Mm. Um, If I was to point out any negatives about the episode, about the story, it was probably some of the more noticeable production hiccups along the way. Um, Little moments where you have to suspend your disbelief just to get on with the story. You mentioned earlier the, the panning of the camera away from... You text as a mask on the table. Yeah. There's a, a scene like that where the camera pans away in episode one and you can see the shadow from the camera. Of course we'll have all these hallmarks of Doctor Who where we have the odd the odd wobble here and there. <laughs> but these these issues are kinda they're just native problems with um with television production. With regards to a score, I, I couldn't that's the only only negative I could really find. <laughs> that aside um i did decide to give it a 10 out of 10 wow that's really good um i can't give it i personally can't give it that high a score but having said that i can see why you know people would give it a 10 out of 10 because i do think actually it is uh it is pretty much perfect drama i think the the, the script is really really good um the story the dialogue how it's structured how no one is um, shortchanged, um, you know, and there's an awful lot going on. It's very rich. It's quite, a, it's quite a mature um, story in many ways. Uh, again, I think it's told very well through the acting, um, the set designs, the costumes, you know, everything as uh, as you pointed out. There are one or two sort of uh, hiccups, um, you know. I think there's one or two moments where you can see that the camera has crashed into something 
but that you know because of the limitations and the time pressures they're just forced to you know just crack on and do it but they're not distracting i don't feel like um oh i can't take this story seriously because no i'm still engaged with it it's still really good uh but i think i'd probably give it an eight out of ten okay and i think it's it's one of those where because even though i really like the story sometimes i feel like um it's not necessarily, and even though it's still one of my all-time favorites, sometimes it's not. It's not a story that um, I could perhaps watch at any given moment. Um, you know, there's certain Doctor Who stories that I can, you know, just put it on and happily watch it. Sometimes the Aztecs, I have to sort of psych myself up a bit. That's not a fault with the story. I think that's more of a fault with me because it's it's still bloody good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, probably eight out of ten. But then I'm yeah, thinking, I should I give it nine out of ten? Sod it, 9 out of 10, it deserves it. At some point we're going to have to say first answer only. <laughs> I keep changing my mind and meet uh, yeah. in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's it for today. Um, Liam, would you like to reveal what the podcast will be about next week? Uh, yes, so uh, the Aztecs is Rob's favourite William Hartnell story. So next week we will be looking at my favourite William Hartnell story, which is another historical and maybe a bit of a surprise because it's it's a story that isn't complete in the archives. We only have two of the four episodes we can watch, uh, which may prove interesting in our review of it. It's The Crusade. Oh.